Today I would like to talk to you about a little bit about co-design project 4. So that's one co-design project within the human brain project and that means it spans across different projects and tries to integrate a bit. But I will not go into too much detail about really what we're doing there. I really more want to focus on the kind of approach we take towards understanding the brain. And that is really the approach that goes from cognitive neuroscience to robotic applications, or at least via appli uh, robotic applications as well. So I would basically like to talk about this uh, entire uh, trajectory, and then at the end go into co-design project <coughs> four a little bit. Because our approach is very much driven from a, from a top-down perspective, I would like to really take some time and explain where all this is coming from because a lot of neuroscience is also bottom-up driven that you would study the neurons, their properties, maybe gene expression and these things. We come from the other side, we come from function. So I will talk about cognitive science and neuroscience, top-down modeling, goal-driven deep learning, so that's one way how to do this top-down approach, and also robotics-driven neuroscience before we then talk a little bit about CDP4. So cognitive science is basically studying the mind and studying intelligence. So it is really um, a functional aspect. It's about understanding how information processing can be carried out by a biological agent. It is highly integrative, so it, is, it spans a lot of fields that are very theoretical and build models but it's also highly empirical. So you also spend a lot of fields that would gather data on, on our level with fMRI, but also on completely different scales. It can be behavioral data, it can be neural data. And there you see it has to be highly interdisciplinary. So you need psychology and that in many regards there come a lot of the more high level theories from. But you also need a lot of neuroscience of course for the empirical side. And we also rely a lot on AI, machine learning and robotics because solutions there might in some sense be translated to the brain or on the other hand something you learned about the brain might help you build better machines. It is rooted in the idea of computationalism and that means really that what thinking is as an analogy to the computer is really that you can understand it in terms of representations and computations. So basically you have representations that reflect some information in the world and computations that transform these representations into other representations. And if you do that step by step, you come from seeing an object to saying this is a cat. What it tries to explain like I said, is always on a very high level. So it's always very much cognitive or behavior driven. So the questions that you would ask in this field is, how do people actually make logical inferences? So how is it that people are able to have inferences of if A, then B, A is given, therefore B? But also how do we humans and how do people in general take decisions? So if you are faced with, let's say, um, two choices. Let's say you're very hungry but also very thirsty and there's a glass of water and there's uh, some food. How do you make the decision whether you drink or eat? These kind of things. So what kind of information goes in there and how is it processed? It can also be perceptual but still from a high level. So you could ask how do people actually recognize objects? And in the beginning we had this from, a, from the level of the Gestalt psychology. So you had some principles that things that are resembling each other or in close proximity, they might be perceived as belonging together. But you can also think about this then in terms of the brain. And that is why we go from the cognitive science to the cognitive neuroscience, because the cognitive science is actually incorporating more and more neuroscience. And I think it is to a large extent becoming a little bit more a cognitive neuroscience field. And basically we just transform slightly our explanation targets. 
So going from how do humans do this or that, we basically ask now, how does the brain carry out certain functions? So how could the brain or some structure within the brain perform logical inference? How could a structure in the brain make a decision? How can a structure in the brain recognize objects? Okay, so that is basically what our work is rooted in. It really comes from this cognitive, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience perspective. And as you see, by the nature of the questions we have, because they are high level, the approach we take is top down. So you really come from this large overview of what you want to see and what, what you want to have. Another name for this is very often also that it is a teleological approach. So basically, you're not starting with first principles and see how they build up to generate something. So you start with the end. You start with your function. You start with the purpose and try to build back. How could you come towards this purpose? And that means we really try to understand the neural system in terms of the function that it serves. And that also means that we are constrained but not driven by more empirical aspects that come from a more a lower level, let's, let's say like anatomy, electrophysiology, neuroimaging, psychophysics. So we don't start with anatomy and see where it leads us. We start with a function and see how anatomy constrains us. Okay, how do we do this? So how can you actually take this top-down approach and turn it into action. David Marr in the 1980s has formulated the, the tri-level hypothesis and we still use this as our guiding principle. And the basic idea here is that the brain is an information processor. So what the brain is doing, it is doing some kind of information processing. It's taking some input, mapping it to an output. And if you want to study an information processor, no matter what it is, it can also be a computer, you need to tr understand it at three levels. And these are abstract levels, they are not scales. So it's not that we look at, at three spatial scales or three temporal scales. We look at three levels of abstraction. The first thing we look at is the computational theory. The second representation and algorithm and the third is the hardware implementation. The first one is really the highest level you can have. It is basically where you try to understand the nature of your problem. If you have a function, you want to understand what this function is and how in very general terms you could carry it out. So this is where you start with your functional analysis. Let's say you have a cash register. You would start to understand it by asking what is this thing doing and why. That is basically the idea. And once you understand what it's doing and why, well, it should add together the values of different items you want to buy. You can decompose it into different logical steps of how it could do that, so how this addition would work. Once you have worked this out on a kind of abstract level, you go into the level of representation and algorithm. And here this computationalism really, really strongly comes back because this basically now means try to find the representations that you need to use and try to find the algorithms or the kind of computations that you can apply to your representations to go from your desired input to your desired output. So if you think about the cash register again, you have representations of numbers, of values, how much something costs, and you can represent that in different ways. You can represent it as binary numbers, you can represent it as Roman numerals, you can represent it, well, as, uh, as the Arabic numerals. So you have different choices in that. And these different choices of that will also influence what kind of algorithms you can use to transform these representations. Because you can imagine that addition might still work with Roman numerals, but multiplication gets difficult. So choices of what you, how you present things affect the choices of 
what kind of transformations you can apply and how you would apply them. And then the very last level is the hardware implementation. So now you have to identify your physical constraints. Now we are not so free anymore. Before we could say we could do it in any kind of way that it would work from an algorithm perspective, but now we have to look into the system and say, can the hardware of this system actually support this kind of transformation? Can it actually support this kind of representation? So again, if you have any kind of digital computer, on the lowest level it has to be binary representations. You cannot start there with Roman numerals or start there with uh, Arabic numerals. So this hardware again tells you something about how you can do your things and how you can use it. And then you really need to know how can what I just figured out how to do algorithmically on the previous level actually do if I need to do it by using neurons and connections between neurons. So globally, basically, the most work from this top down is within the second level. A lot of work also comes from here because there you need to start, you need to understand your problem and constrain your second level. We, for instance, rely on a lot of work that other people have done on the third level. So you need this information, but this is not in our approach so much the, the central focus. But it, again, is a very, very strong constraint on what you want to, good, what you want to get. But the second level can also inform the other levels. So you could also say, I have found a way how to implement something on the second level. I have certain ideas what my representations and algorithms could, could be. This could be implemented in a neuron that maybe has a certain way of reacting to input and output. Let's say I need a neuron that not only codes its input in terms of how much it fires, but also in terms of the phase which, which, uh, with which it fires. So the time to the first spike might also be relevant. Of course, we know that these neurons exist, but it could also be that this sets us on the path to look for some neurons that might actually have the properties we would expect them to have, given that we have found an algorithm here that works. So this can also drive us back towards the other levels and go, for look, go looking for things over there. So the question is, how do we do this in real research? Historically, the way to go is really you look at all these things and you come up with your own theories and try to basically hand engineer the solutions. Nowadays, due to the development of deep learning, the idea is to also use some kind of goal-driven deep learning approach. So you basically take the power that you get from these machines, you know that they can solve a lot of functions, a lot of tasks, and see if their solutions can help you in some way understanding the solutions that the brain might have, obt uh, might have obtained. So the basic idea is you would think that the brain and the deep neural network might be confronted with the very same kind of behavioral task. So you might think they have exactly the same input and output relations. Both of them really need to do the same thing. We also have some information that make them biologically inspired and therefore add some kind of biological constraints to what they can do. On the one hand, we have individual units and we have connections between units. So that in some way resembles neurons and connections between them, or at least neuronal populations and connections between them. We also have nonlinear activation functions, so we, we know that neurons might have a threshold and start spiking at a certain frequency, or they might uh, continuously encode the, the strength of the input. We can have all these things similarly in a neural network. And we also have some other interactions that you see in neurons, like lateral interactions, where Due to lateral inhibition, you get some kind of response normalization. All these things are in the, in the deep neural networks as well. So you have some kind of biologically inspired constraints there anyway. 
But of course, with many things, especially when they are more high level, this part is unknown. So you don't know what the representations are at all the steps. You know only the input and the output. And you also don't know what transformations you have in between. So the question is, can we not just take our deep neural network, give it a task that is realistic, train it, see what kind of solution it comes up with, and then see if we can map this solution onto the brain. So can we map the model components, so that's the different layers in the neural network that learn to do different things, onto brain regions and then try to predict new neural responses based on this mapping. Of course the question is, yeah we could do that, but is it, is it enough? Is this relatively loose constraint actually sufficient to allow the hidden layers in a neural network to build something or generate something that has any kind of relation to activity you would measure in the brain? Does it in any way resemble, let's say if it's a visual task, activity in visual area 1, 4 or even IT? And the answer is a careful yes, because there are some studies that have started to, to take this approach and it seems to be working. <coughs> For instance, we can say we have a neural network whose task it is to recognize all the objects in an image. So it moves a little square across the image and says here's fish, fish, bear. So we try to, to, to train the neural network to do exactly that because we can do it. We want the neural network also to be able to do it. Once we have done it, we take the neural network, split it up in all its layers, and then we show the neural network lots of different images that he would also show a person in the scanner, let's say. And then we see whether we can find a mapping from each layer in the network to a specific part of the brain. And in this case, what they have done is they have taken a kind of a regularized regression approach that they could say, OK, I take all the voxels in this area and try to predict them from this, from this uh, layer in the network. And then I take that network and try the same, and that network and try the same. And then I take an approach where I have a model selection Yes? What kind of sample size are we talking about? Sample size in this subject? Yeah, for, for this sample size you mean in terms of images or in terms of how many people? In terms of images, for training the networks, millions. Mm -hmm. For this, hundreds, maybe thousands if you really push it. So the mapping ha uses less images than the training. But that's simply because you cannot show millions of images to a person in the scanner. So you would like, you know, that's why. <coughs> and then you have a model selection procedure. So you basically have tried each layer for each area and just select the one that works best. And ideally you would want this to make sense, right? If you have the progression along the hierarchy in the model, you would hope that your that the mapping would reflect this progression. And in this case, it does. So that's already your first stage of seeing whether your model can give you anything about the brain. You first have to get this mapping. If you have a network that does not find a nice mapping that makes sense, you can already say, well, this is probably not a network that can explain us anything about how these computations are happening in the brain. Still, this mapping is the first step. The next step is to predict the neural responses that you get once you have done your mapping. So now you can run an experiment, and this is a kind of a classic experiment from Hexby where he would show you houses and faces and he would try to see whether there are brain regions more reacting to houses than to faces. And you can do the same kind of experiments in humans, so you get some kind of ground truth. And you can run the experiments with the same images also on the, on the model and use your mapping to predict what kind of output you should get. And you can see whether these kind of, of these predictions match your actual empirical results. 
at this point you have validated your model. You have not yet learned anything new about the brain, but at least you have now taken the second step and validated your mapping. And now comes the interesting part. Now you can go into the model and try to rip it apart and see what is going on inside the model. So now you can say, okay, I know there is, this is my input, this is the next layer. I know what the representation here is, now I can look, what is the representation here? And what kind of connections are in between, because these kind of connections implement your transformation. So you can really now, step by step, look into both the representations and into the transformations. Basically by looking into what these networks learn, what kind of crazy filters, what kind of receptive fields does it start to develop. And you can do that of course with respect to the input, so you can say what does this layer like with respect to what was coming at the input, but you could also say how does this layer transform just what is coming from a previous step. So you can really go step by step and try to understand something. And this is really, this is new, this is exciting, because we did not have really a nice way before to generate hypotheses about what these kind of representations would be at these higher levels. We were very good, maybe up to here, that we had some idea with orientation, tuning, and all these things. But the kind of more abstract representations that develop later on, we can now have a look at thanks to these neural networks. And if they're also mapping onto the brain, we have some reasonable degree of confidence that we can actually learn something about it. But of course, there remains a challenge. And that is actually at the same time what the strength is. So now we have the system, we can look at it, but this system itself is very complex. So now you have basically replaced one complex system with a different complex system and try to understand a new complex system. Why we still do it, what still the advantage here is, is that this new system you can poke in any way you want. You can break it, you can take it apart, you can reassemble it, you can look at every individual aspect of it and you can change every parameter you want in, when you set it up for learning. So should it learn faster? Should it learn with a different activation function? How does that affect my, my filters? Can I make it in that sense more brain-like and in that sense? And how does that affect my conclusions? So yes, it is still difficult, it is still complex, but this is something you can really, you can really go deep into and, and, and play around with at every single stage of its, of its processing and its, uh, its setup. Okay, so that is one of the approaches you can take to try to understand what, in which way you can get the kind of representations and transformations you need to understand information processing in the brain. Another one, which is relatively new, is now to, go to say, okay, we do a kind of robotics-driven neuroscience. And the idea is again very simple. You say, Humans and robots are in some sense confronted with the same behavioral task. Both of them are autonomous agents, both of them are in complex and dynamic environments, and both of them have to somehow deal with this. The other thing is that humans and robots both have bodies. And that's very important because very often when you look in neuroscience and you make for instance, uh, you, you're engaging in the theoretical aspects of neuroscience, so you build computer models of how the brain works, they are never embodied. All these aspects that are related to how the body affects your information processing is never there. And that makes a huge difference. So you do have to think about the physics of the body and the mind. Reaching something is very different if you just simulate the forward motion on a computer compared to when you have something that actually has weight and actually has to react to what with all the in physical environment that uh, affects it. Like before, level two is always unknown. It's the one we want to understand. 
So the question is, can we not try to solve a certain problem for the robot? So let's say the robot is faced with something. It has to, to reach a certain object, and to do that, it needs to know where it is in space, so it needs stereoscopic vision. It needs to have depth perception. Can we not try to get this robot to work, to do this? and then see if we can apply our solution in some way also to the brain. So can we learn through solving a task how the brain solves the task? And in this case I would just like to give you a very very simplified example of how you could do it. Imagine that your task is you want to solve a maze. And what is important, like I said, with the three levels is first try to understand your problem. Try to understand what you actually have to do, what the properties of this maze are, and what a very general solution could look like. So in this case a very general solution could be just follow the wall. Keep one hand to the wall and just walk and just make sure that this hand always sticks to the wall. What will you do if you do that? you will find your way out. It's not the most efficient way, but this is a very simple algorithm that you can use to solve this. Why is this relevant? Because now, having this very simple general logic, I can already see a few things about what's, what I need to implement later. I know that if I just have a wall on my right, I move forward. If I have a wall in front of me, I turn left. If on my right there's an opening, I turn right. It's all you need to do when you get out of it. Of course, now we need to consider the, the other constraints that we have. This time we have a body. So we have basically the, the main body of the robot. We have some wheels and motors. And in this case, while well, the robot doesn't have hands, but it, he might have a proximity sensor. So he might just feel if something is close enough. So we could build a little robot like this. It sees in front and it sees towards the right. So basically it does not have the right hand only on the wall, it also has one in front that not to bump into the wall. But you also have the physics of the mind. So the mind is not just software, in this case the mind is also hardware. So you have cables, you have, a, you have a circuit board, you might have logical gates. So you might have a robot that only really works with logical gate. It can get two inputs and say, are both on, then yes, I do something, or is either on, I do something, or only if something is off, I do something. And the funny thing is in this little example, the solution is extra, actually extraordinary so ordinarily simple. If you have the sensor that looks towards the front, if it sees nothing, it lets the left wheel turn. If you have the sensor towards your right, if it does see something, it lets the right wheel turn. That's your entire solution. So how does it do in the maze? It sees something on its right, so it turns now see, uh, moves forward, sorry, it now sees something in the front, so it turns the left wheel off, which means the right wheel still turns, so you get the left turn around. Now it doesn't see anything on its right anymore, so it turns the right wheel off, the left wheel still turns, and it turns around. So by that you have, from analyzing your problem, found a viable solution. Of course the last part is now, because we're interested still in the brain, how can you translate these kind of things again into, into neural things, into brain models? Well in this case we used only logical gates to get this whole thing going and any neural network, if you have sufficiently many layers, can implement any kind of these kind of logical gates. So basically we can directly translate 
from this, which basically says here A or B and not A and B. This is a logical X or, an either or situation, but not both, which you can implement in a neural network. Here you have activation strong enough to drive this neuron if either of the two are active. This one is only on because of weak connections if both are active. This one activates this, but this one inhibits this. So you get the exact same behavior also in the neural, brain, in the neural network. So there are ways to translate this back into a neural kind of system. Like before, of course, we have again our remaining challenges. And our remaining challenges stem again from the kind of assumptions we would like to make. Yes, humans and robots are embodied, but like you saw before, this little robot didn't look like a human at all. So these bodies are very radically different. So the question is, to what extent can you actually still s claim that the human and the robot are facing the same kind of behavioral task if their bodies are so radically different? Well, it depends. On the one hand, the field of neurorobotics is actually interested in having human-like robots. So they're actually pushing to have robot bodies that also resemble more and more the human. And that goes very, very far. You could say you have a humanoid robot because it has kind of a human-looking body, it is biped, it has two arms. But that is not even enough. You can imagine that having a a motor that turns your arm is very different than having muscles that pull the arm up or down. But even that, people are trying to build these kind of machines where you really simulate even muscle fibers and try to understand how you could generate movement for this robot and see if that can explain also movement in the human because now you have a very, very similar kind of system. So, yeah, it can work if we make the, the robots more humanoid. But it can also, in some cases, really not work. The robot I showed you before is absolutely not human-like. Nevertheless, you might say that some components still are. And then at least when you study the aspects of these components, how to solve s problems faced with these components, it might still work for the human. So even if, the ro if there's a very industrial robot arm that uses two cameras, you're still faced with stereoscopic vision. And you might, by solving it for the robot, still translate some of it to the humans. And that means, at least by solving similar and related tasks, you can still learn something for the human. OK, so that is the very global idea of this kind of, of approach to take. You have a question? question yeah, sure. Okay. Um, like for the adaptive neural network that you just showed, essentially, how do you, uh, how would you factor in control theory? So, like, if you want to actually have a more viable model for this, this is something that people are looking into. Or? Yeah, you ca so you can have different things. You can have on the one hand uh, that you take it really from the machine learning approach, and then you could have something like uh, uh, reinforcement learning and on top of it. So you actually have something like deep Q learning where you try to have an action policy relationship as well as a deep neural net that, that understands what it's seeing. So basically, the neural network learns to understand what it's seeing, while at the same time around it, there is this reinforcement learning approach that interprets what it's seeing as a state, and based on that state, selects actions. So that is one way you can do it. You can also do it uh, by taking already neurons or, or neural networks that are not static like this, but have also temporal components. So you can, also you can also think of neural networks that are more like dynamical systems, and then you can ap apply the control theory aspects that you know you can use for the dynamical system. Yeah, just to give you some context, because I'm thinking of the, uh, the annual CEFs framework for interceptive inference. And within that framework, there's a lot of work in cognitive sciences trying to look at like predictions and correction and control of action and stuff like this. So like, I was just wondering if in your experience people are already looking into this and already trying to merge. All yeah, yeah, people are looking into this. They're looking into this from, from really uh, the dynamical systems point of view, f 
from the machine learning point of view, but also from the neuroscience point of view. So some aspect you might have is, for instance, if you learn to make a movement and you have to fine tune it, you might have uh, a simulation of, of the cerebellum in there that learns from the error in, in your movement. So if you move a little bit too far, it, it, it learns that this was wrong and it learns to correct this. Is it like Smith predictors? <coughs> or? Um, I'm not familiar with Smith predictors, no. <laughs> Okay, question so far okay? Maybe you can talk about it afterwards. All right, so this is the general approach and now we have co-design project four. So now we have actually something where we want to apply this. So this is all about visio motor integration and we are now in phase two and we uh, have at the moment two phases kind of charted out what we want to do. The first one is that we want to have saccades for object recognition and we want to have a closed loop embodied system, so we want to bring the robotics in. And in the next phase, or in the, the phase two that really just started, it's about then going beyond eye movements and having also reaching and grasping movements. And here again, we start from this highest level. We say saccades solve a problem. This is not how we see the world. We only see sharp around the area that we uh, fixate in an image. As soon as you go too far away from that, it blurs out very drastically. So if you actually want to see what is going on in a scene like this, you need to make saccades all around it. You need to look around and get some high resolution snapshots from all the different regions and integrate that in order to understand what's going on. So we have a problem, drop off in resolution, we have a solution in a high level, saccades. So now we do our functional analysis. How do you get these kind of saccades that help you to recognize objects? You can say there are basically four components to this. You have your object recognition part, so that's, that's fixed. You have some system that can recognize objects in the images it sees. But because it does not see everything clearly, we need to compute a kind of saliency, and saliency just means kind of bottom-up attention. What region in your visual field will pop out? And that needs to be able to do that even if you don't have a very sharp uh, resolution of it. But even in your peripheral vision, you will see if suddenly it starts flashing, or you'll see if, if something is red on a green background. These kind of pop-out things you need. You need to know where to orient your, your eyes. Once you have that and you have kind of a, an inventory of where something interesting could be happening in your visual scene, you need to select which of those regions you actually want to look at. So you need some kind of mechanism to, to have that. Based on that, you have to generate your saccade and then you get back to your object recognition. So you have a new piece of the puzzle to try to understand what you're actually seeing there in front of you. And you can keep on doing that. So the first level in the object recognition, the most important part is, of course, that we want to know why is it that we don't see sharp everywhere. And the, region the reason is that you have a lot of ganglion cells in the retina really focused in the center of your vision, in the center of, your, of the eye, and they drop off as you go away from that. So actually what you have in terms of representation is that you have a lot of representation for the center where you look at and very little around. And that means you get a blow up in the center and a compression in the periphery. So this is what your visual system has to deal with. But the nice thing is that it preserves some kind of relationships that we know empirically between spatial frequency tuning and eccentricity. And because it does that, this is amenable to be used by convolutional neural networks. So that means we can still use weight sharing in convolutional nets, which basically means applying the same filter everywhere because the same filter becomes a different filter by being placed in different regions. The next level is the salience prediction. And for that we use uh, a deep convolutional autoencoder. So basically a system that has an image as input 
it encodes it with a lot of different computations in between, and then it decodes it again into an image, but it does not decode it into the same image that you saw before, but it just decodes it into the salient regions. So it just tells you where is something interesting in that image. And once you have that, you can feed it into a target selection system. And the target selection system is really doing only one thing, and that is engaging in a decision-making process. But not a binary decision, it is a multiple choice decision. Each individual point that you have in front of you could be the target for your next saccade. So this needs to push and pull between each other and decide which one of them will be the winner where you will have your next saccade towards. And once you have that, you can feed it into a system that would translate the displacement of your eye that you want to have, so you look here, you want to look there, into actual eye movements. So you need something that translates this into the saccade that you want. And that is, again, a biological constraint. You don't want a smooth movement from this point to that point because that is simply not how we do it. We make ballistic jumps. Okay, are we forgetting a lot of other levels? Well, we try not to. So first of all, we always try to keep some kind of biological constraints in mind, basically on two levels. The first is we want to have architectural constraints. We know what kind of brain regions are involved in this task, and we have some idea of how these brain regions communicate. So let's say if you want to build a deep neural network that does some aspect of this, it should not have more layers than there are brain regions of which we know that they are involved in this. It cannot do this with some extra information that we don't have. And the other type of constraint we need to add comes from the very, very small scale. And that is, of course, that we have at some point to take into account that we're not just dealing with a unit with some kind of static activation function, but that we're dealing with populations of neurons which can have very complex dynamics. So we need to at some point also take into account that what we have found as a system to work using this kind of approach needs to somehow still work once we do this. On the other hand, once we have this, that might also tell us, oh, we now have actually a degree of freedom more that we can use to find the kind of algorithms that we're interested in. So yes, we're still constrained. And this is what we then want to have in the end, yes? Um, what, is, what about the next lower level, so about synapses and plasticity? Are you also considering that? Or? Yeah, in, in, in this core design project 4, we're not going into the level really of modeling, let's say, beyond the point of point neurons. Mm -hmm. So we got go beyond the level of neural populations towards individual neurons, but these neurons are point neurons. Okay. So that means they also don't have um, dendrites or axons or these things. But the point neurons can, of course, still have different channels. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that we're interested in. The thing is that because this system needs to do a lot of things, so it's big, it's very hard to translate every aspect at once mm. into this level. Yeah. So very often some levels will be on the high level mm. and then have one aspect that is translated to the, to the very biological level and they need to communicate with each other. Another reason is also because in the end this should be embodied in a robot and then you also need to have still enough computational power left to simulate this whole thing. Yeah. So what you have here is actually already a, a simulated robot in a simulated environment. That's the neuro robotics platform that has been developed within the Human Brain Project. And it's, here's its view. So it has a camera, it sees something. And here you see the kind of salience that would be predicted based on what the, what the robot is seeing. And that is this model I showed you just before. So this robot, it really likes, it really likes the lo oops, it likes the logo, so that's always salient, but it also likes that the red ball 
in this otherwise relatively gray background is rolling down. So now it is embedded into the robot, and from here we can see how it can help us to understand or to, to, to build robots that can do more things. And as we encounter problems there, the solutions to these problems might again help us to learn something about the brain. Okay, if you're interested in some of the, the studies that I showed you and, and some related further reading, reading, I just have it here, you will get the slides. And otherwise, I would like to thank you for your attention, and if you have further questions, let me know.